Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jennifer Baxter. I'm the library director for Athens Limestone Public Library. And actually, I got this um, in the mail. <laughs> I got these great flyers about your um, offering your program in the mail, and I thought, this is amazing and wonderful, and I would love to have you. So, um, Dr. Sherry Williams is a historian of the modern American South, including the past, present, and future of rural historic landscapes and cultural tradition, traditions in Alabama's Black Belt with an emphasis on social history through the lens of race, gender, and class. She is a public historian. Dr. Williams is the first African-American woman to be conferred a PhD in history from Auburn University. That's incredible. She is the executive director of the Ridge Macon County Archaeology Project, which operates an inter inter interpretive center in Warrior Stand that offers educational programming focused on the history of the federal road through Macon County, multicultural migration, and rural community development. That's a uh, incredible background that you have. So we're very pleased that you joined us today. And um, I'm going to let you take over and, and introduce yourself and your program. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for um, uh, participating in this program today. And I want to say thank you also to the um, Athens Limestone County Public Library for inviting me today. And uh, on behalf of the Caroline Marshall Drawn Center for the Arts and Humanities at Auburn University and the Drawn Seminars in State and Local History, um, I wanna welcome you to this presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and get started with that. I need to share my screen. Um, right now, a host is disabled, so I think it needs to be enabled for me to be able to share my screen. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Okay, there we go. All right, so can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen and let me know that I'm looking at the same thing that you're looking at? Okay, great. All right, so again, welcome to this presentation. It's called Come Now and Let Us Reason Together, Cooperative Extension Club's Empowerment of African-American Farm Women and Girls, 1928 to 1965. Um, I'm going to be speaking on this topic for about 45 minutes, and um, I really want to watch my time to make sure that I, I leave um, plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. And um, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat, and we'll address them at the end, or um, if you just want to ask the question when we get to that segment, just you know, feel free to unmute your mic and, and jump in. So. Um, I want to start off by looking at this picture and talk about some of the things that are happening in this picture as a sort of like an introduction to this topic. So this photograph was taken in Montgomery County in 1928, and it is a home demonstration club meeting. And of course, I'm going to be talking about home demonstration clubs for women and 4-H clubs for girls. And the setting that you see um, as far as the racial and gender makeup would not be uncommon for 1928 Alabama during Jim Crow. Um, and, and taking into consideration the gendered roles of men and women uh, on farms. So here we have a group of women, they're gathered and it looks like this is a demonstration on canning and preserving food. Um, the person who's standing uh, in the middle of the uh, picture is probably Lucille Davis. She was the Dallas County um, home, I'm sorry, <laughs> I said Lucille Davis, but I got ahead of myself. Um, she was in Dallas and this is Montgomery. So let me backtrack on that. But th the woman that's standing with the belted dress on, she is the home demonstration agent. So. We see a couple of things going on. We see that it's it's an all black space um, with you know women. They're talking about canning. Um, it's a learning sort of interactive space that you see in front of you. In fact, you can't really see it because the title covers it up. But on the left side of the screen, the two women sitting at the very far left, they're actually peeling potatoes while they're listening uh, to this. Um, you know, to the agent talk about how to can. I think she's talking about peppers. Those I blew it up so I could get a good 
uh, view of what she was holding in her hand. It looks like a bell pepper. So again, this is, um, this is important for setting the stage for what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that for in just a moment, but just keep in mind, you know, all black female space and what is going on in this, in this space. And that's really the whole focus of my presentation, which is based on my dissertation research. So the title itself, it draws from a letter that was sent by African American, uh, by an African American home demonstration agent and her male counterpart, which was called a county agent um, in Macon County in 1932. And they use this phrase, come now and let us reason together in a letter that they sent to all the county leaders. Um, and county leaders would have been men and women who belong to local clubs, like the one that you see pictured on your screen, um, but they have been elected by their peers to serve on a county council. Um, so this letter was sent to them to invite them to attend their annual planning meeting. And the annual planning meeting was very important because that was the meeting that all of the county leaders and agents came together at the beginning of the year to decide on what issues and problems families and communities face, what were the most pressing challenges, and then they developed a program to address those challenges based on the uh, areas that um, home demonstration touched on, which for, for women would be um, sewing, canning, uh, food preservation, gardening, um, child care, and several other different categories. And for men, it would have to do with, you know, crops and, and livestock and things like that. So they would decide on what, what were the pressing problems, what were the challenges, and then they would uh, collaborate with the agents to develop a plan for the year to address those problems. So um, I'm going to talk more about this letter that was sent further along in the in the presentation. Um, but I, I want to highlight something here that this this study has a historical underpinning. In other words, I approached it from the standpoint of a, a, of a historian trying to exp explain causes and you know change over time and all the things that historians focus on, but I also borrow some concepts from psychology and sociology to analyze and interpret human culture and human behavior, because that's an important aspect of this whole process. And so the central theme of, of um, my presentation is that Black agents and the women that participated, um, I'm sorry, that Black agents in the structure of, of the home demonstration and 4-H club program especially the leadership development component, that that facilitated this, uh, what I call a process of inner or psychological emancipation. Um, and that is very different from emancipation on paper. You know, you can say that somebody's emancipated on paper with the stroke of a pen, um, but the, the, the process of, of becoming um, uh, to the point where you value and you appreciate the fact that um, you are worthy um, and you are, are worthy just as a human being and then you are worthy to um, access all the rights and privileges of being a citizen. Um, sometimes that can be a process for people to go through. And so what I'm arguing here is that these clubs empowered women and girls to believe um, those things about themselves, to believe in their potential, and what they could do for their communities. So I wanna go ahead and go to the next slide and talk a little bit about the background of home demonstration and 4-H clubs. And they actually were um, started as informally in local communities as canning and tomato clubs. And they were decentralized. And by that, I mean, there was no um, state agency attached to them, no state or national funding that was attached to them. But when the Smith-Lever Act of 1914 was passed, it monetized and centralized and formalized these clubs pretty much under the same structure as far as, you know, what the focus was, um, domestic uh, practices among farm women and girls. And this was formalized under the United States Department of Agriculture's Federal Extension Service. 
So again, home demonstration clubs served adult women and 4-H clubs served girls ages nine to 20. Um, the agents provided, well, the agents were responsible for number one, recruiting women and girls to join clubs, um, to, to set up, to, to go into a community and set up this, this club structure, recruit women and girls to come into these clubs. And then as they came in, provide them with interactive lessons and in scientific home management. Um, in my time, when I was in um, elementary and middle school and high school, we called it home ec. Um, and now it's called family and consumer science. Um, but again, the areas that they focused on were poultry raising, poultry raising, gardening, canning, childcare. And so in this photograph on uh, this slide is a photograph of an agent doing a demonstration on culling chickens in Madison County, Alabama. And culling chickens is just a process of sorting out the productive hens from the non-productive hens. Um, but again, an another point of emphasis is that these clubs uh, at that time were segregated by race and by gender. So as I studied this, um, studied these clubs uh, and studied the structure, the USDA structure, and learned about how things operated, I realized from the evidence that um, it's, it was kind of complex as far as the schools of thought at the upper echelon of, of the USDA that sort of filtered down even to the state and local level. And there were some that were of the mindset that this, this was an opportunity to assist farm families in becoming uh, self-sufficient, in becoming, um, you know, exercising self-determination and just being able to um, sort of be at the table and make decisions that would make their communities better. While others thought of it as a way to sort of pacify people and keep them in the South. Um, and then there was a, a camp that felt like uh, rural Southerners, black and white, and especially African-American were backwards and that they just needed to be you know, brought into modernity and that, you know, they just, they just didn't have much faith in them. And at that time, when these programs kicked off at the early part of the 20th century, the United States was industrializing and, um, you know, political leaders and, and business leaders were looking to the South to feed the nation. So there was a concern about whether or not the uh, Southerners had the capability to do that. And, and those who worried about it were the ones that thought that Southerners were backwards folks. So my claim, and, and this is getting back to the central theme that I, I mentioned at the, at the beginning was that from the 1920s to the 60s, and the 1920s was when um, these clubs were pretty much established throughout the South, um, that the, the agents that were employed with the USDA's uh, Federal Extension Service used what I call empowerment pedagogy to cultivate self-confidence, citizenship rights, consciousness, and leadership skills among rural African-American women and girls who participated in these clubs. And that some women and girls eventually parlayed these valuable skills into their involvement in the Black freedom struggle and community development in later decades. So I wanna pause here for just a second and sort of unpack this claim as far as defining some of the terms. So when I talk about empowerment pedagogy, um, what I mean by that is instruction that develops the capacity of individuals to identify an issue that's concerning to them, to mobilize around a common cause, to resolve that issue, and to act decisively to promote their cause. And then when I talk about the Black freedom struggle, um, it encompasses um, various movements and, and actions that African American forged uh, including what, you know, most of us probably would call the modern civil rights movement of the 60s. And those movements would be for the purpose of securing full citizenship rights and equal protection under the law. So the Black freedom struggle is, in my mind, is ongoing. 
And it includes um, what historian Charles E. Cobb calls the liberated consciousness of self and community, which sort of speaks again to this idea of psychological, psychological emancipation and knowing that you're worthy, that knowing that you have um, the right to um, all the privileges that are available to American citizens. And then the last term is community development. And I define that very simply as fostering self-determination and self-sufficiency within communities to achieve community well-being. And that can include an, an economic component, but um, in my research, I focus more on the psychological part of that. And so rural community development is really just one form of the Black freedom struggle. So how did I get interested in this topic? Um, I am, a, I'm not a, a certified genealogist, but I'm a genealogist. I do family history research, have been doing it since I was in my 20s, and I'm now in my 60s. Um, and to be honest, I, I came, I stumbled on uh, home demonstration agents annual reports. Um, agents, whether they were black or white, all agents were required to report, write formal reports and submit them um, and detail and outline the activities that their clubs had engaged in throughout the year. And so I came across these reports and noticed that the earliest ones all the way up to maybe even the 50s, um, contain what I call a folksy element in that they named the women and girls that participated in these clubs by their first and last name um, and by the communities that they lived in. So it was kind of easy to trace these people back to the census. And uh, so actually I was looking for relatives in Macon County. Um, I was born and raised in Akron, Ohio, but my grandparents on my mom's side are both from Macon County. And so I was, you know, trying to do some research beyond the census and look in, in places where you wouldn't think you could learn about your ancestors. And I came across a mention um, of an agent named A.M. Boynton who worked in Dallas County. And I thought um, that the reference was to Amelia Boynton, who you see pictured on your screen on the right who was an iconic civil rights activist. And um, I later learned that Laura Daly, who was assigned to Macon County on the left of your screen, she also was a civil rights activist. And so these two women had these inclinations. They were middle class, they were educated, and they just came from a background where um, they were taught from day one to believe in their potential and, um, to pay it forward. So any education or any advantages that they had uh, while they were, um, you know, growing up and growing into young wom womanhood, um, they were taught that it was their responsibility to serve others with their, you know, whatever privileges they might have had. And so um, it, it's an interesting mix because you know, although they were educated and although um, they came from uh, families that um, were considered to be middle class, they were still African American. They were still living in Jim Crow world. They still were um, oppressed. And so it's interesting that they were able to sort of embrace all of this. Um, and put it to service for Black communities. So I mistakenly thought that the person's name that I saw in this report was, uh, in fact, Mrs. Boynton, when it was actually her sister-in-law that was assigned to Montgomery County. But before I, I realized that, my thought process was, oh, wow, you know, she was she was a force to be reckoned with. So when she met with her clients in these you know, settings where there was all black women and, and they were in a private space like the one you saw at the beginning um, in a home where there was no, nobody looking over their shoulder, nobody monitoring what they were talking about. My thought was, hmm, what, what did they talk about in these meetings with people like uh, Mrs. Poynton and Laura Daly? And so that was one of my questions, and I'll, I'll share some more in just a minute, but I do want to pause for a second and talk about um, the agent in Limestone County. Um, and I just looked this up uh, in the last couple of days, but 
Her name was Ella McKissick, Ella Bell McKissick, and she was an agent from 1928 to 1953 with a Dr. Hill in Limestone County. And from what I'm finding out about her, she did some, some wonderful things. And it sounds like she is of the same sort of categorization of these middle-class black women who one um, scholar, Stephanie Shaw, calls socially conscious individuals. So the rest of my research questions were um, that I had seen some scholarship that argued that people like Laura Daly and Amelia Boynton and probably Mrs. McKissick, um, they imposed white middle class standards for homemaking upon impoverished rural black women and did, did not address these women's real time needs for their families and for themselves. And then my thought was, well, if this was true, why were these clubs so popular? And they were in fact, very popular. Um, I studied Georgia, Alabama and Mississippi, but my presentation today is limited sort of to the scope of Alabama because we're, um, you know, we're focusing on Alabama people um, and they were popular in Alabama as well. So why, why, was, why were they popular? And then we already talked about the second um, bullet point. And then the third one was, if in fact these clubs developed black women leaders, how did it happen? And what's the evidence to support that they applied their leadership skills to improving their communities um, and in the black freedom struggle in general? So some of the causes, um, these were sort of the main causes of this empowerment process that occurred. Number one, and I've already talked about this, that black agents were serving their clients in the name of racial uplift. In other words, they were empathetic and they were invested in what they were doing. Why? Because they were black women and they understood what it was like to be African-American um, living in a Jim Crow world. Um, the second cause would be the fact that the Federal Extension Service um, had a leadership development mandate. Um, a third cause would be that Black women and girls meeting in these all Black spaces had aspirations for, for a better life for themselves, for their families, for their communities. And so that was a cause for um, the popularity and the cause for um, even an intergenerate transmission of sort of this this uh, emancipated mindset throughout decades and throughout generations of women and girls. Another cause would be what I call Afrocentric beliefs, cultural traditions, and cultural expressions. And I'll talk about that more shortly. And then a part of the, the Afrocentric beliefs and traditions was kinship that fueled participation in clubs. And then the last uh, thing was, or the last cause, uh, would be that these activities were psychologically emancipatory among club members who, due to being both Black and female, su suffered a double oppression uh, of themselves. So I'm going to uh, go into sort of unpacking each one of these causes and um, some, some of the information, if you don't mind, I would just read it verbatim because it says it better than I could ever paraphrase it. So I talked about the leadership development mandate of the Federal Ex Extension Service for these clubs. And, it, and that mandate was this, all volunteer leaders who participate in home demonstration work, whether officers, news chairmen, or those who pass on instruction to their neighbors, receive training in the designated responsibilities from members of the home demonstration staff. Thus, in addition to improving homemaking practices, Home demonstration work develops abilities of leadership among rural women. It places upon them responsibilities of organization, of program planning, of passing on the information to their neighbors, and of analyzing results. They learn how to preside efficiently at, at meetings and to speak easily and forcefully in public. So there's this mandate and it applies to African-American women and girls. So, I mean, when you think about just um, the fact that women historically were considered to be second-class citizens anyway, and that 
you know, during this time that we're talking about the first 50 years of the 20th century, you know, before uh, the women's uh, the second wave feminism and really took off um, that this is pretty powerful, you know, to to look at women in this in this light and realize that there's capacity for them to be leaders. There was another component that went into this, and this has to do with this complex aspect of the USDA, and that would be that, well, to get this to work, you have to have women willing to embrace these strangers coming into their communities and teaching them about things that they have been doing for years. Um, so what is a way to get women's buy-in to join these clubs and be a part of these programs? And that was to give them a seat at the table, to give them a voice, to help them, um, to bring them into the decision-making aspect of these clubs. And so the leadership development was designed to do that. So there were certain roles that women and girls could take advantage of um, as in their participation in their, club, in their clubs. They could just join one for one thing. Um, another it, a role they could take on would be to become an officer or a committee chairperson on the county council, because there was a county level council made up of all the leaders, the local leaders. And um, they, they were the ones that I was referring to at the beginning when I was talking about the invitation to the county leaders. Um, they could be a delegate to a state conference. They could attend short courses. And a lot of those activities happened at Tuskegee Institute. Um, and they could serve as a project leader. Um, if, if the community decided that they were going to do a poultry project and the women and girls sort of mapped out what that project would be what the goals and objectives of that project would be then among the the club women um women could arise up and say hey i want to be a a project leader and i want to take a lead role in this so they had and i'm not i'm not touching on all of the opportunities but these are just a few of the opportunities that they had and out of these opportunities and roles um flowed uh, an enhancement of leadership skills that were already there and present among women or just developing new skills. And so on the right side of the screen, you see sort of a repeat of what was in the mandate as far as the types of skills that um, women and girls were expected to develop. And it's problem identification and, and setting goals and objectives and planning and re-delivering and organizing and presiding and directing and managing and problem solving and analyzing. And so all of these skills, um, I mean, they, meant, they meant something, especially again, for African-American women and girls, because outside of these settings, maybe in their churches, but even those, you know, we, we're talking about a patriarchal society anyway, right? Um, so this was, a, this was, this was a rare and special opportunity um, for them to, uh, you know, develop and flourish and blossom. So the energy from these clubs, even though it was a top-down program with the USDA, you know, administering this program from the top down, those effective, successful program delivery and, and outcomes, that, that was energized from the bottom up. Um, and again, it was this idea, it, if you want women and girls to buy into these programs, then you have to give them a voice and opportunity to direct the activities of these clubs. And that's exactly what happened. And that's what you see pictured at the bottom. And actually I kind of like this diagram because the bottom is sort of what gives this whole thing some stability, right? And a foundation. And so um, it, these clubs have been called a, a, administered from the top down, but, but worked from the bottom up. And that is exactly what happened because if, if women and girls didn't buy into them and if they didn't join, there wasn't a need for them in the first place. So uh, another cause that I talked about um, early on was aspirations. Uh, another cause was culture. And again, I'll just keep referring to this idea of this all black domestic space because that was 
a great contributor to this psychological process to sort of be free to, to happen. Um, but this photograph is from Morgan County, Alabama. It's also taken in 1928. And it's a woman who's showing off her quilt that she's made to the uh, the two agents that are pictured. I'm assuming that the, the woman who made the quilt is the woman on the right with the white blouse on and that the agent has the hat on. In fact, the agent with the hat on was pictured in the very first slide. Um, and, and I'm not sure of the identity, but um, you can just see the, the workmanship that went into this quilt. So even, even the projects themselves, aside from the psychological benefit, um, was valuable, as well as the fact that these clubs provided a social outlet for uh, women in rural communities, which, you know, they could be pretty isolated. So this was a great social outlet for them. Um, another thing that kind of, kind of drives home this point about aspirations is this photograph of a home that was improved in Montgomery County. Um, on the left is the before home and on the uh, right is the after home and I sure hope your directions are the same as mine. Um, but you can see that the improvement in the home, I believe the agent that you see talking to the um, farm wife is the same agent from the very first slide because this is again Montgomery County. So it, it sort of boils down to this. Um, when I was when I was growing up, I used to hear I used to hear my elders say, if you know better, you do better. And so that's embedded in this process as well, this knowing better and doing better. But I want to take it a step further and say, if you know better, you do better. And if you do better, you keep on wanting to do better. And so this idea of, you know, I've gone from this home to this home, what's next? You know, and it's like, I have this, this is mine, I'm entitled, I can't, I, you know, I have the right to have this. And so, you know, if you do better, you keep on wanting to do better. Um, and then sort of wrapping up the causes, um, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of kinship and cultural traditions and how these elements fuel the popularity of clubs and at the same time allow for this transmission of sort of this consciousness about being a citizen and a consciousness about knowing that you're you're worth something as a human being and that you that you are worthy as a human being and worthy as a woman how this sort of flowed across generations so um the first block is um, collective beliefs about blood and fictive kinship held among uh, African American people. And, you know, one of the primary tenets of this first idea or these first beliefs is that the home, family, and community are sacred, that uh, elders nurture children, and it's children's job and youth job to respect and listen to your elders. And then collective beliefs about education um, and, you know, from even from before emancipation uh, up to this time, African Americans saw obtaining an education as like a passageway to citizenship and a passageway to a better life. Um, you know, you might have heard stories about enslaved people who risked their lives just so they could learn to read. Um, and so that's deeply in, embedded in African American um, beliefs. Of, uh, overall. And one component of that, I'll emphasize this for later on, is that religious and moral instruction belong in all educational settings. Um, so these set of beliefs flowed into traditions, things that people actually did to sort of represent the fact that they believe these things. And one of those would be that parents sacrifice to provide educational opportunities for their children. Uh, and they would always admonish children to and youth to take advantage of opportunities to learn. And I experienced that myself, um, you know, growing up, it was just like a mantra, you know, like get your education, get your education, go to school. Um, and then the, the last thing in that uh, segment of cultural traditions is that family and community members place the good 
of the family and community above the individual. Um, and so there were traditions and there's expression of traditions, right? So we have, we have holidays that are, you know, and holiday traditions, but how do we express those traditions? Well, we get together, we have food, we, you know, we, we do something, right, to express a tradition that we have. And so the expression of, of these cultural traditions were for adults to serve in some capacity in their community and for youth to also serve, but also to pursue their education and participate in any opportunity they had to learn and grow. And the work of um, what they called at that time, Negro Home Demonstration and 4-H Clubs aligned perfectly with those traditions and how they were, um, how women and girls sought to express them. So outside of a church setting, for example, they, they could belong to a home demonstration club or a 4-H club. And it was perfectly at that time, um, you know, in our nation's history that culturally, um, you know, with women and girls expected to have this sort of domestic um, foundation, these were perfectly acceptable outlets for expressing these cultural traditions. And that's another thing that made these clubs popular. So um, when I talked earlier about um, agents embracing and, and, and understanding um, Black rural communities from the standpoint of number one, they were African-American too, and they too had experienced oppression um, in a Jim Crow society, they, they knew what, what cultural sort of references would resonate. And so in this letter that you see on your screen that's dated February 16th, 1932 uh, from Laura Daly, who we met earlier in the presentation and her counterpart, R.T. Thurston, they were inviting uh, countywide leaders to attend this meeting. And the invitation was this, come, let us reason together. Let us work out and adopt a plan that will help us to get the most out of this year's work. And um, that comes directly from the Bible, Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. And though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, they, though they be red as crimson, they, they shall be as wool. And when you take that out of a religious context and kind of think of it in a social context, it's almost saying, you know, it's, it, it may seem, you know, it may seem challenging now, but if we just come together and we reason this thing through, you know, it's gonna get better. And so they knew that this reference would appeal to their county leaders. And that goes back again to that tradition, uh, that belief that religion belonged in all educational settings. Um, today, you probably would not see a reference like that, but at that particular time, it was, it was accepted, it was understood, and it was almost a given. Um, that you would see something like that. And then the last uh, cause that I want to talk about is this idea of kinship, whether it's blood or fictive, and how kinship fueled the popularity of the clubs, number one, and um, this process of this sort of emancipated mindset just across generations, um, continuing to be um, a factor in, in, in the leadership development processes and this sort of I, uh, idea that women were becoming confident and they were um, just becoming um, stronger in their, in their abilities and their skills and knowing that they did have something to offer to their communities. So I took two people from Dallas County, Alabama. One is Emma Roscoe and the other person is Minerva Roscoe, her little sister. They both were involved in um, home demonstration and 4-H. So Emma was an adult woman, so she was in home demonstration and her sister was in 4-H, but they both became leaders. Um, uh, Emma at the neighborhood uh, club level and at the county level, and her sister followed sort of in her footsteps. And um, they, uh, Emma was uh, involved in home demonstration for years. I'm not sure exactly how long Minerva was. They called her Minnie for short. And Emma's the woman that you see pictured in the, um, in the photograph. And that photograph was taken in 1954. 
And for a very, very long time, the mainstream press in America, when they reported on what African Americans were doing, it was not by name. They called them, you know, so and so Negro got, you know, arrested for, you know, whatever. And so to see a uh, African American woman in the newspaper, um, in the Selma Times Journal in 1954, painted in a positive light. Um, and, 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 and there's some complexity there too, because there were some ulterior motivations for, you know, reasons why um, uh, white politicians and, you know, businessmen and prominent planters and farmers supported these programs. And I, I don't have time to get into all of that. But still, I mean, the fact remains that she could, uh, Emma Roscoe could open up this paper and see her, her picture in the paper. So that was very powerful, um, at least from the, the standpoint of a, a Black female at that time in our, our nation's history. Okay, and then the last thing um, I just want to point out is this idea of how popular these clubs were. So this is a table that starts in 1928 when Laura Daly um, first came to Macon County, and it ends around 55, 58, um, as she retired, she retired in 1955, and uh, Leon V. Battle became the home demonstration agent. And Leon is a woman's name. Her name was Leon Vivian, I think is her middle name, uh, Battle. But you can see in 1928, when Daly started, that there were 16 neighborhood clubs and 296 women enrolled. Um, enrollment peaked. Um, the, the enrollment increased steadily over time. It, it peaked, I believe, during the war years and immediately following World War II. And then the, the, the uh, number of clubs declined um, in 1955, but you still had a higher enrollment of club women than you did in 1928 when she started. Someone asked um, at the presentation last night what I thought the reason was for that, and, and I actually said, you know, I'm not real sure, but I think, but I can tell you for sure after I've had a chance to kind of look into it a little bit more, it had to do with resources and the lack thereof. Um, Daly in her 1955 report sort of says, you know, if we had a larger county staff, uh, we could, you know, we could do more. And so um, part of the inequitable structure of, of the Federal Extension Service was that black um, the black program was underfunded, so that might have been a reason for the ten clubs. So change over time. What happened from 1920 to 1950, 1960, as far as this idea of psychological emancipation? Well, in 1944, Laura Daly had worked with home demonstration and forest club women for 16 years. And she wrote a paragraph in her annual report for that year um, that where she attributed the success of the extension program in Macon County to local leaders. Um, I'm going to read that quote for you in just a moment, but in the photograph here you see her pictured in um, with Mrs. Lizzie Peterson. And Mrs. Peterson is working in her English pea garden. And, um, you know, it, it, she, Ms. Daly looks a little bit different than she does in the photograph on the front, but I really think it's, this is all within the same time frame. but she was in her 50s by then. And uh, she had dedicated her, her career as an agent pretty much to Macon County. So what she said, so she knew what she was talking about, right? She had been there for decades. And her quote is this, she said, um, to facilitate the extension program in Macon County and make available extension information to all the farm families, leaders were elected to represent the 36 communities and 152 neighborhoods, divisions, and subdivisions into which the county is divided. These leaders have accelerated the spread of information by holding meetings, conducting result demonstrations, giving method demonstrations, and helping individually their neighbors to learn about and participate in not only the extension work, but bond drives, war chest drives, Red Cross call, and similar wartime activities. 
This leadership is voluntary, but is functioning more effectively and efficiently as the leaders grow in experience, which they do in spite of the limitations of little education and low income status. So her paragraph in my mind is a, is a testimony to this process of psychological evaluation in that um, she said it herself that, you know, as, as leaders grew in experience, and this is over her decades, right, of, <laughs> of working in the same area, um, that, that it just got better and better. So, you know, there's this idea, if you know better, you do better, and if you do better, you keep on wanting to do better. And um, for those bureaucrats at the federal level who saw this um, you know, as a program that would pacify African Americans to the extent that they would not migrate away from the South, that they would stay in their place as agricultural laborers, sort of like was this unintended con consequence, like, whoa, what's actually happening here is um, these people through this adult education program, um, as far as adult people were concerned with the home demonstration clubs for women and the uh, clubs for men, which had a different name, they were, were they were gaining something um, that was very powerful and began to manifest itself in other ways with some women and girls. Um, and so that is what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides is this idea of parlaying leadership skills beyond extension work. Um, so the iconic Amelia Boynton Robinson, uh, her maiden name was Platts, by the way, so sometimes she's Amelia Platts Boynton Robinson. Um, she acknowledged that while she was a home demonstration agent in Dallas County, she went there in 1930 and I believe served as an agent until 1936 when she married Samuel Boynton. Um, she urged her clients to register to vote. And had that been known among her superiors at the time, that would have been like, you know, agents were fired for doing things like that. Um, but she um, she said that that they could not just see teach, uh, see only teaching scientific management to people and teaching them how to be more docile, how to be more brainwashed. And they urged their clients to register to vote um, and even to own land and to become economically self sufficient. Her, um, one of her charges was of Rebecca Anderson, who was born in 1898, who was not um, a person who would necessarily be considered to be middle class to elementary school education, but she was involved in an officer at the county level. She attended a farmer's conference in Tuskegee and she later on parlayed her leadership skills into mobilizing her community behind the Selma voter registration movement. Um, she herself attended voter registration classes and she registered to vote. And so um, Lucy Upshaw was the agent in Dallas County who succeeded um, Ms. Boynton. And she wrote um, a statement in 1955 in her report that sort of um, it sort of underscores this idea of, and I keep repeating this: knowing better, doing better, doing better, and keeping keep on wanting to do better. And so I'm going to read her quote. Uh, her quote before I close. Um, she said this. She said that Dallas County community extension leaders developed long-term goals that included improving land and other assets providing a sound economic base under each family, enriching the development of all phases of rural family life, including more and better leaders, fostering greater appreciation of proven American ideals and principles of democracy in action, and farmers themselves implementing solutions to problems individually and collectively. And she wrote this in 1955, and what that says is that these leaders understood that their community development focus 
um, pointed to the need for a more aggressive approach to obtain conditions that would be favorable for their um, for their communities and for themselves. And that aggressive approach would be political participation. And so it's, they were primed and ready for the voter registration movement. Have, um, one last example, um, Sarah Logan from Lowndes County, Alabama, you see pictured in the middle um, between Stokely Carmichael and her daughter. Um, she, was, um, she was educated, she was a teacher, um, but she was also involved in, in home demonstration work. And um, she was responsible uh, for parlaying, well, she parlayed her leadership abilities, um, which I'm sure, you know, being educated, being a teacher and being in home demonstration, they all kind of enhanced each other. I'm not saying that home demonstration work alone uh, foster her leadership skills, but she did go on to challenge um, the Alabama law that made it possible for African-American teachers to be fired from their jobs if they participated in the civil rights movement. So she's just another example of one of, when I say some women went on to parlay their leadership skills into broader arenas, she was, she's a perfect example of, of one of those women. So the significance of this study, again, is it, it's, it places a, a strong emphasis on psychological emancipation and explains how these clubs facil facilitated personal fulfillment, leadership development, and rural community development that led up to the civil rights movement and was responsible to a degree in stimulating rural Black women's participation in the movement as community mobilizers. And it also can be seen as a model for today's social justice movements to focus on learning about local community needs and not just dictating solutions without knowing what those needs are and then involving local people and strategizing to meet those needs. So I will close here and thank you so much for your attention. And if you have questions, um, please feel free to either type them into the chat or um, you know, unmute your mic and just speak up. I think we have what, maybe 10 minutes left. Is that right, Jen? I was kind of curious, is there anyone in the audience who ever heard of Ella McKissick, the agent, the um, black agent for Limestone County? Dr. Hill, I'm certainly going to dig into, <laughs> into that a little bit more. I was, I was looking for a photograph uh, online. I couldn't find a picture of her, so, but I'm going to keep digging. Um, that wasn't one of the counties that I studied um, in, in uh, my research. I tried to stick with counties in Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi that were sort of like hotbeds for civil rights activity so that I could tie, you know, read um, SNCC documents and, um, you know, documents from other civil rights organizations and see if I could find the trace the women, you know, if they were documented in other types of records for their activity in the movement. So I do see a question. Um, the question is, what kind of spaces did home demonstration and 4-H clubs typically meet in? Churches, homes, farms, etc. cetera. Um, the neighborhood club meetings met in private homes typically, um, and 4-H clubs could meet in private homes, but a lot of times they met in black schools. Um, and then as far as the, the neat thing about this process too was that not only did you have black women meeting in private all black spaces, they also had an opportunity to um, kind of show off what they have had been doing in public spaces. Um, there was uh, a ham and egg show in Georgia, for example, where it started out where um, it was mostly focused on men and, and, and ham. <laughs> but an agent in Georgia, um, she saw that, you know, for this to be holistic, you know, it needed to present the best examples 
of, of, of what farmers could do on the domestic side. And so it brought, it brought um, women and girls into this, you know, this really popular annual event and they were able to showcase their skills publicly. So it kind of, it was, it was a sort of a neat aspect of, of this whole phenomenon because, um, you know, there was a, there was a respect, they call it respectability politics among black women where, you know, the quieter you were, the better. I mean, it's like you wanted to move through life and not call any attention to yourself because you could be publicly abused or, you know, um, maligned and not, not do anything to provoke it, but just because you were black and female. And so this idea of appearing in these public spaces and being very present in these public spaces sort of kind of, you know, went against that idea that you have to be quiet and, you know, just stay out of sight and nobody will bother you. So that was another neat finding uh, about how these clubs benefited women and girls from a psychological standpoint. Yes. Um, I, first of all, thank you very much. And you have a beautiful smile. I have to say it just lights up. But thank I was you. just sort of um, intrigued by the necklace that um, Mrs. Platt was wearing, the one it looked like cameos. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if it was of a black woman or she liked it because it was, I, I don't know that you would know that answer, but I found it intriguing. You know, I, I really don't know. Um, that's a good question. And if, if I come up with an answer, I will email Jen and maybe she can, Thank you. she can get in touch with you. But, you know, that was, that was her, you know, later on in her life. I mean, she mm -hmm. just passed away like within the last I guess five or six years. I don't remember yeah. exactly. She lived to be in her nineties, I believe. Um, and so who knows? Um, she might, she just liked pretty things and, mm -hmm. you know, that necklace, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll check on that. Thank you for, for that question. I mean, what if it was Sojourner Truth or, you know, Phyllis Wheatley or something that would be even better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be great. <laughs> and it wouldn't surprise me at all because of the kind of person that she was. Um, Dr. Williams, I've got a question of, I guess, more of a personal nature. Yes. Uh, uh, during World War II, my mother was employed in home demonstration in Madison County, Alabama. Uh -huh. uh, she had a degree in home economics from Auburn and she graduated in 38. Uh, anyway, she was not a part of course of these clubs or anything like that. But, and, and I, I don't have any recollection of it. I mean, this was like a decade before I was born, but I wish she were still around to talk with you. But anyway, I know she would have loved your talk. Anyway, from what she indicated, most of her, the families that she assisted were African-American uh, in Madison County. Mm -hmm. um, and I noticed that um, most of your photographs, most of, the, most of them seem to have come, or many of them seem to have come from uh, the special collections at Auburn. Yes, uh, that's exactly where they came from. So I, I guess my question is, I mean, apparently there's a repository of photographs on this topic at Auburn, especially yes. collections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and is there also maybe a repository of transcripts, maybe oral histories or something about, about this experience or, or no? Or, oral histories maybe as they are embedded in agents' reports, but I don't think there's a separate repository per se. In fact, when I was researching this for my dissertation, I didn't find like one standalone archive of you know, oral histories having to do with these clubs. Um, you know, I'd have to look at bigger collections and sort of just kind of pick through them to find out if, if anybody mentioned home demonstration and 4-H and its effect on their lives. But I will say that Auburn is, uh, it's wonderful that we have access to the, all the reports for all the counties in Auburn. Um, they, they do have the records segregated so that you can read the, the Negro um, home demonstration program, uh, there, those agents reports. Um, and it's not segregation like, you know, a, a malicious thing. It just makes it easier to access these reports. And so um, for Georgia, for example, I had to go to College Park, uh, Maryland to access those records because they're not housed at an institution like Auburn, you know, a, a, like UGA or 
another uh, Fort Valley State College or, you know, um, an institution like that in Georgia. So we're very fortunate to have um, these records archived, both at College Park, but we also have access to them at Auburn University. Well, you've done some great research. and I, would, I really appreciate you presenting this to us. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for that question. And I, I wish I could talk to your mom too. <laughs> that would be great. Um, most of the women that, that served as agents, most of them are not around uh, anymore. They're not with us anymore. Um, I did interview people who were influenced or their lives were touched, you know, by an agent, but I have not Mm -hmm. met any people that are were actually agents they became close i mean I, I remember she told me they would exchange gifts and all these kinds of things uh during the war and it was really therapeutic for my mother too because her husband my dad was off at war and uh so she was by herself and she was searching i think for a purpose and this mm -hmm. this gave her that right right yeah. and again you know it's 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 for all the reasons that I talked about as far as being a woman in this time that these there was benefit across the board regardless of race um and so I'm glad that that you shared that with us um it's just that for African-American women they had a different sort of significance and that's just because they were both um African-American and uh female yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I knew yeah. that was outside the scope of your research, but I just wanted to, to share that. So, yeah, yeah. No, thank you for sharing that because it's sort of like it expands this, this idea of, uh, you know, women having a voice just in general, right? Um, that, that these clubs did a lot for a lot of women, like I said, across the board uh, for similar reasons and then for different, some for different reasons, right? Right. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, out of curiosity, and you may have touched on this in the beginning, but I'm, I'm interested in how this particular program came to be in 1928. Like, did you do any research on the origination of the, the federal program and how it came to that particular area? Well, well, once the Smith Lever Act monetized this under the purview of the USDA, then it was <clears throat> it was sort of up to state governments to determine state and local governments to determine whether or not they were going to um, allocate funding because you know the funding trickled down, and um, so they they were the sort of gatekeepers as far as you know whether or not this county had a program or not and so it's not it it didn't it didn't get implemented at the same time as more staggered as far as when clubs in a particular county might come into existence and to be honest like the um the first clubs served uh white male farmers and then the next wave african-american male farmers and then the next wave was um, white women, white farm women, and then lastly were um, African American farm women. So, and one state might have done it sooner than another, you know, for those populations. So it was just, it was just a matter of state priorities, and uh, you know what people wanted um, as far as politicians and and uh, powerful people in the state and communities. So really probably not all that different from how it works now and it, theoretically except that we've kind of hopefully equalized the priorities a little more at this at this juncture i'm always interested in public policy and how things originate and then how they flow that's one thing i'm interested in but two i did want to tell you that this was a wonderful wonderful presentation you made it very interesting and um, i hope that I'm not an I'm not an academic, so I don't know how all that works. But I hope that your your work is published and I can read it. I'd like to read it and that you put it into a book. <laughs> I'm hoping for that. <laughs> I'm working on it as we speak. So yeah, I I, I just think it's exciting because um, I don't know that there's other scholars that have definitely well well before me identified the importance of these clubs. The difference between their their approach and mine is I was just really trying to dig into the local level and say, well, how, you know, 
how were leaders developed from this? How could you can and you know learn how to can and become a leader <laughs> was basically my question. And then the other question was for me as somebody who was, um, I was seven years old when the March on Washington took place on August 28th, 1963. In fact, it was my seventh birthday. Um, but um, as I got older, you know, it's just, and I learned history, it was like, what happened to African-American people where they were seemingly, for, in my, in my, from my perspective, like suddenly positioned to ag actually agitate for civil rights? What happened? What led up to this? And I think that these clubs and, and the leadership development and, and this process of emancipation all fed into that and facilitated that, that process. Not the only thing, mind you, but certainly a very important a very important aspect that has unfortunately been overlooked, I think. Yes. Well, uh, thank you. And I wanted to tell everybody that's on here today that um, Dr. Williams has agreed to follow up with us to do a podcast. So we'll be posting that um, at some point if you're interested in learning anything further about that. And we'll share that um, when we have that edited. So again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. A very informative and wonderful presentation. And I appreciate you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all again for being here. And thank you for your great questions. And I really appreciate it. Thank you.